But at this point, uh, all we're going to do is figure out the magnitude of the force of impact on Mr. Palmer's face. So we have this final velocity. Now notice this is the final velocity during the circular motion. But that makes it the initial velocity during the collision. Because it is at this moment. That moment right there, which is the final velocity for the circular motion, but is also the initial velocity for the collision. So we can substitute that up here, 0 minus 5.44 multiplied by our initial velocity for the collision, 22.5234, divided by, we need the change in time during the collision. So now, we're talking about the change in time from this moment to that moment. But the problem is, is that this takes place in less than one frame. We can see that from the video, that I'm just starting to so strike the water here, and I'm done colliding with the water here. So all we can say directly about time is that it's less than 1 30th of a second, less than one frame. Now, that's all we can get directly from time, but we can assume, uh, let's take a look at this, this is during the collision. We can assume during the collision that my face follows uniformly accelerated motion because we're going to have a force of impact here which is going to cause uniformly accelerated motion. And looking at this, we can tell that my head just barely stops after the collision. So my head goes about the depth of my head or the width of my head into the water before it stops. Therefore, during the collision, the change in y is equal to the negative of the width of my head. Don't worry, I've measured the width of my head. The width of my head is approximately equal to 0.21 meters. So the change in y is negative 0.21 meters. Just like u fishy m and uam, we need five variables, or we have five variables, we need three to figure out the other two. We have now one of the three variables. What are the other two? Claire, give me one that we know during the collision. We know that my head is going to stop. Velocity final, notice this is in the y direction because we're talking about the change in y, so the velocity final in the y direction is equal to zero. We know one other thing. We should have from boards. Yes. What is it? I know. Final velocity, we know the final velocity in the y direction. We know the change in y we need. Give me the other one. There's one more that we know. Austin. Mm, uh, final velocity. Our initial velocity. Right, which is? 23, or 22.5234. The initial velocity is not, believe it or not, the 22.5234. Who can tell me what it is and why it is not the 22 point whatever? Sure. This is 19.5534. Why is that the correct answer? Because it's uh, in the line. Remember, everything we're doing here is in the y direction. We could figure out the displacement along the hypotenuse, but we don't need to because we have the displacement in the y direction and the final velocity in the y direction, which is for the circular motion, which is the initial velocity for the collision. So yes, our negative 19.5564 meters per second. And of course, that's going down, so we're going to use the negative there. Uh, we are actually going to use the equivalent UAM equation to the u fish m equation we used before, which is that the displacement in the y direction equals one half times the velocity initial in the y direction plus the final velocity in the y direction times the change in time. The change in y is negative 0.21, which equals one half times the initial velocity, negative 19.5564 plus zero times the change in time. Therefore, the change in time is equal to two times negative 0.21 divided by negative 19.5564, the change in time during the collision. Zero two one five. Can I have one more? Zero two one four seven. Four seven. Okay. So we estimated earlier that we could see from the video that the time of the collision actually was less than one thirtieth of a second. One thirtieth of a second would be 0 .03 repeating seconds. 
So you can see that the time of the collision is clearly less than that, and now we have a much more accurate uh, description of that time. So we can come back to our original equation for the net force of impact, and we can substitute in our 0 0.02147 seconds, and we can get the force of impact during the collision. Force of impact on this bone fit. And that is in newtons. Note the negative simply illustrates that the direction of the force is opposite the direction of the velocity of my head, which makes sense because it's slowing my head down. Again, we're not too concerned about the, the direction, so we'll just leave that negative there, indicating that it's opposite the direction of the velocity. Now, this in newtons is not very helpful, so let's convert to pounds. 4.448 newtons is one pound. Newtons cancel out, and we're going to get this in terms of pounds. Great, that's in pounds. With sig figs, we'll just use two sig figs. Seems like a good approximation. 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds of force on Mr. Palmer's face. The mass of a Yugo, which is a pretty small car that's no longer being made, is 525 kilograms here on planet Earth. That corresponds to 1,155 pounds of force. This is essentially like parking a small vehicle on Mr. Palmer's face. So the question I have is, how is it that we could park a small vehicle on Mr. Palmer's face and this visage could be as beautiful as it was before him? Ah, it is. doesn't have to do with the displacement of the force. The displacement of the force is 0.21 meters. The displacement of the force determines the time, which determines the force. So this doesn't have to do with specifically the displacement of the force. Not in this particular case. Why? Why am I still so beautiful? That's the question. Because water is soft. Ah, it is because water is soft, but I want to get more to the, the physics of it. If, if the water weren't soft, it would be different. different things here. Got it. Uh, I agree it all has to do with that. That's why I can go to a depth of 0.21 meters. How long are we parking the vehicle on my face? 1 50th of a second. Okay. Truth is, you couldn't actually park a vehicle on my face. It would not work out. Right? Because it would, it would be on there for a lot longer. Because this is such a short time period, I can actually withstand it. You all can. You can get up and do it again. But that is the reason why I can survive this and still be so beautiful. <laughs> That's the statement. Um, let's talk about safety for a little bit here. This was 1999. Uh, it was wakeboarding in 1999. Uh, and wakeboarded for years. One of my older brothers in 2003 was wakeboarding, and the wakeboarding wakeboard actually came off his legs and came around and amazingly hit him in the forehead right here. Uh, produced a very large gash along his forehead. Uh, my father was a doctor, so we of course had a suture kit, and we took my brother into the kitchen. We created a sterile space on the kitchen table, and uh, sewed my dad sewed him up. I took some pictures, um, and this is a common event throughout my childhood. I have all sorts of different uh, scars from where my dad sewed me up after I cut myself doing something. Um, after that, we uh, decided it was time to wear a helmet when we were wakeboarding. We also wore a mouth guard. Mouth guard and helmet while wakeboarding. Summer of 2004, July 2004, my little brother is wakeboarding. He attempted for the first time something called an air rally. So you come across, you hit the wake, you pop the board up. So you basically jump up, but you throw your legs back as you do so. So you end up being lateral like this. If you do it really well, you get the board up high. And then you bring the board back down and you land. So it goes, you go up, 
and then back down. He got the up part, he did not get the down part. He landed somewhat like this, okay, with the board in the water. So we'll take this as the rope, this as his hands, this as his body, this is where the wakeboard landed. So he landed essentially like this. The wakeboard essentially stopped his motion, but the boat kept going, which meant it looked like this. And this right here is where his head is. And while wearing a helmet in a collision only with the water, my little brother got a concussion that was so bad he didn't know who he was for an hour. This was his third concussion, and uh, he had it was a very serious event, and he ended up having to see a specialist because he was having symptoms, and he continues to have symptoms to this day. This was, remember, in 2004. He, one of the symptoms that he suffers from is that a computer screen has a refresh rate, and it's evidently very tiring on his brain to watch a computer monitor for an extended period of time, just as an example. My point here being that you have a brain. Please very, be very careful with it. That being said, I bet some of you noticed this item on my leg. I have a knee brace that I have to wear whenever I play any sports of any sort. That's because in the summer, actually August 2nd, 1990, I was playing soccer. It was an uh, exhibition match with, uh, I believe, a team from Holland. Uh, I had scored three goals against the goalie. We ended up losing the game 5-3. With only a few minutes left in the game, uh, there was a cross, I was playing right wing, a cross, the ball was coming toward me. I went toward the ball, the goalie went after me. Uh, and you could see there just happened to be a lady taking pictures on the sideline, and she took a picture at this moment, which is the moment right before my knee was destroyed. This guy's right knee is right above my right knee. He landed with his right knee right here, and what he did was he bent my knee this way. He ripped off my lateral collateral and anterior cruciate ligaments. I tried to stand up. I couldn't because my knee buckled. My coach told me to go home and put some ice on it. My parents were not there. Um, a friend of the family said, you know what? They would want him to go to the emergency room. So they took me to the emergency room. Eventually we figured out all of this stuff. I had to have surgery. Before I had surgery, I could take my leg and I could just bend it this way because there were no ligaments holding my, my leg in place. I was uh, in a wheelchair for a month. I was on crutches for five months. I did physical therapy for a year and I have a knee brace that I need to wear for the rest of my life whenever I play sports. And I'm very careful to avoid certain sports because they are very bad on your knees. And let's face it, I have a bad knee. In fact, if you look at my knee, you can see, by the way, the scar from the surgery. I also have another one up here. Um, one thing that I can do, which you cannot do with my leg, is I can take my leg and I can bend it like this. If you look carefully, you can see that I can actually bend it in that direction, which is not a direction you should be able to bend your leg. Okay. Because this ligament right here, which was completely torn off when they reattached it, it was no long, it's no longer as strong, and that's why I have to wear my knee brace. August 7th, 1990. In a typical parent move, the morning of surgery, my mom says, we don't have a picture of the car. John, go stand by the car, We're gonna, let's take a picture of the car. 5 a.m. before my knee surgery. There I am. That's the mom look on my face. The reason I have a camera is because I handed my anesthesiologist the camera and I said, could you please take some pictures of the surgery? I would love to know what my knee looks like during the surgery. So you are going to see two pictures of my knee during the surgery. I'm going to show you in a moment. You do not have to look at these pictures. I am not compelling you to. I'm not telling you have to. You could choose not to look at them. I have had a student pass out from looking at these pictures. We had to call an ambulance, and the emergency personnel had to come and make sure the person was OK. I have checked with administration. I can still show these pictures. You do not have to look at them. If you do not want to, don't look. Is that clear? All right, here we go. This is my knee. You can see this is where the scar is clearly uh, because they cut open my knee. 
This is my favorite tool. I wish I knew what it was called. It is a fork bent at a 90 degree angle so they can stick it in and pull the meat to the side so that they can get to what they're really trying to work with. And you can see here, they've actually got these um, wires here which are attached to the ligament and they're moving stuff around right there. This one is my favorite because you can actually physically see the ligament right there which they're attaching. You can see that they've sewn up my knee a little bit. This down here is just a bandage where basically it's collecting the blood as it leaves my leg. And these right here, you can see I did have some arthroscopic surgery done as well on uh, various things. So, those pictures are gone. One of, what they did is they took the patellar tendon and they took the center section of the patellar tendon out and they replaced it, um, the anterior cruciate ligament, with that center section of the patellar tendon. So I don't have uh, the middle section of my patellar tendon, it's actually all scar tissue in there. And I actually have holes from where they, they used to, I used to have screws in my knee holding that um, anterior, or the patellar tendon in where the anterior cruciate ligament used to be. I no longer have those screws in there because I had them removed after a certain amount of time because it had healed. To summarize, you have one body. Please be very careful with it. When Dr. DeMogge, my um, surgeon, talked to me when I was your age, he told me before the surgery, he said, the goal of this surgery is to make it so that you can walk without a limp. That's the goal of the surgery. Um, I had a friend who, at around the same time, had a minor injury to his knee. He tore his anterior ligament a little bit. I was very careful to listen to my doctor and do what I was supposed to do, and I've been very careful ever since then to wear my knee brace whenever I need to and not to do things that are dangerous for me in particular and my knee. My friend did not listen to his doctor very much and didn't wear his knee brace when he should have. He had injured his knee a couple more times, uh, and in the end, his knee is actually now worse than my knee is. We, we make choices. We are different people. Right now, I have made the choice that I am not going to be skydiving. When my children turn 18, my wife and I are going to jump out of a plane together. Because at that point, I can die and my kids will be fine. Right? They can jump with me if they want. Okay? I don't wakeboard right now because I have to balance fun with reality and how dangerous things are. Please be careful. That's my lecture about wakeboarding. I hope you enjoyed it.